Hey everybody, how's it going? Dan Schindler here on this shift with Even Schindler. And we are thrilled to have first time offender, just like last week. We had John Weathers on of Gentle Giant, and today we're excited to have Derek Shulman, not only of Gentle Giant, but of Polygram, Adco, Roadrunner Records, uh, Stablers 2 Plus Music. Uh, back in, I think, 210, and of course, was very instrumental in signing, wow, a lot of bands that you folks have stumbled to your car uh, after go going to see Silarenda, Kingdom Come, uh, Bon Jovi, Dream Theater, uh, reviving careers of some flash-in-the-pan bands like AC, DC, and Bad Company, not familiar, but I'm sure they're good. Derek, welcome. How are you? I'm, I'm doing well, thank you. How are you guys? Great. I'm doing great. Yeah, thanks for taking time. We really appreciate it. Um, Steve, go ahead and kick it off. I don't even yeah. know what you're doing with everything. Yeah, so kind of going back to last week, uh, one of our viewers, Roger Manito, was curious about how John Weathers got to sing lead vocals on the song Friends. So what's the story there? That's a good point, actually. That, that was the, story, uh, the story about that was... Um... It was a, a piece written kind of like with John. John kind of had a, an idea and Kerry helped him. Um, and John's got a great voice. I mean, he's, you know, he sings, he sang on stage uh, together with us. And um, it was, you know, it, it was a, a nicer sort of a quieter piece. And Kerry usually sang the quieter pieces on record. But we said, John, give it a shot. And John said, OK, I'll try it. And in fact, it turned out extremely well. So John, uh, you know, it was something that we threw at John and as, a, as a kind of curveball. And he said, let me pick it up and then uh, and let me try. And it came, it came out very well. So really, it was uh, something that um, we, we all said, come on, you're, you're, you're a singer as well. Go for it. And it basically, you know, turned up on the, on the album. Yeah, it's a really nice piece. Um... Being both of us, Steve and, and myself, and a lot of people watching on Yes Shift and we're simulcasting on Drum Talk TV as well, are huge Roger Dean fans. What was it like working with him for the cover of Octopus? We heard he's really hard to work with. No, I'm kidding. What was it like, <laughs> though, getting with Roger, and how did that come about? Um, well, back, back in the day, I mean, Roger, uh, when we signed orig our original deal with uh, Vertigo, um, he was basically the go-to artist for a lot of Vertigo artists. And he didn't, didn't just do Yes and, and right. he did Ossipisa, um, Horse, I can't, right. he, he, yeah. was, he was a go-to artist. I mean, there wasn't Roger Dean, the sort of the the the, the, the artist that everyone knows that Yes uh, works with. But back in the day, he was the um, the guy that, you know, did the cover. And, and we had a couple of other guys um, give Octopus a shot, and he came up with this fantastic cover um and um it turned out to be the the album we see in in rest of the world we had a different cover in in uh, in, in, in north america um but roger just he was the guy basically the go-to guy and the guy that hired him was a guy called jerry broad who was our manager at the time so we were just yeah let's get roger he's good <laughs> and, yeah, you know, and you make such a good point he's, yeah he's so synonymous with yes but yet, even though you can see Roger Dean in Roger Dean's work, whether it was with you guys or Uriah Heep or any of these other bands, he didn't make it all look the same. Like even Asia doesn't look like Yes covers. And I, I think that's the mark of a really true uh, visual artist to be able to do that. Yeah, I think, I think Roger, um, I think the Octopus cover is, is kind of different to a lot of his other works, actually. Um, yeah, definitely. You know, it's actually quite a little more lifelike and less less sort of uh airy fairy kind of like uh um phantasmical yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah. Which, which i like i think it's fantastic yeah he didn't eat mushrooms that day <laughs> maybe that's right maybe that's <laughs> right. i didn't think about that and then we know that in the early days you toured with yes i know steve is very curious about that yeah do you have any particular memories to share about uh being on the road and playing a few shows with them and other bands as well, for that matter. Yeah, but, but yes, we're uh, back in the, back when I'm um, yes, we're 
started in 78, 77. Uh, so they had a bit of a head start on Gentle Giant. So there were, you know, there were, we, when we toured with them, that was, I think, 1972 um, in North America. Uh, and they were, I think they were promoting either, um, which one was it? Um, was it Fragile? It was a, the uh, Close to the Edge. Close to the Edge album. And they were, they were superb, honestly. They were really, really together. And, and their stage show was, it was fantastic. I mean, they were, they were great musicians and the show was fantastic. They, they, we, we, uh, we opened for them. And, and to be honest, uh, I think that when we played a couple of shows, we got a very, very good you know, reception. This is our first you know, North American tour. Um, there was a little, little concern on their side that we were a little too good for, for, for them to, you know, to, to uh, um, you know, get, we, we, had, we had a standing ovation, we had a, um, an encore. Um, and I think, I don't know whether it was their manager or something or whoever it was, but I think um, as the pro tour progressed, the stage, of our stage that we were allowed to li uh, live on, if you like, and the lights we were about to, allowed to use became less and less. Mm. <laughs> there was that element of, well, your guys are, you guys are pretty damn good, so we're going to you know, make sure you don't get quite as much uh, uh, airspace, if you like, than, than crazy. All that. Anyway, but it, it was, it was fun. I mean, they were great. I mean, they were really great musicians, and I, I knew them. I, I knew, I've done them afterwards. I've worked with them after, yeah. you know, after the, the whole uh, um, band thing, et cetera. But, yeah, they were, they, were, they were good to work with, and it was a good tour for us. You know, I want to mention, since you brought up, it was close to the edge that first tour. So many people, and rightly so, believe that Close to the Edge is the seminal prog rock album. But I've got to say, Octopus, I think, is right up there with it. Even just taking the song Knots alone. And then on that tour for that album, excerpts of Octopus, just even that, there's some really neat stuff. Were, were the members... Were the members, uh, what am I trying to ask? Was everyone always agreeable to how things were going to go? Because like not sounds so complicated to have written, especially being, you know, the whole vocal thing rather than, you know, on instruments. Can you kind of unpack that a little bit for us, Derek? Well, it was it was written by uh, Carrie, actually, it was, but it was a score. It was scored by Carrie. I mean, so it was written orchestral. I mean, as an orchestral piece, yeah. so you had to sing these orchestral lines, and they they, they merged into into whatever you hear. Um, so it was yeah, it was pretty uh, difficult to to do. But nevertheless, um, one thing that we did, uh, we were, you know, we were hard workers. I mean, we were hard workers on the road. We were hard workers in uh, our, um, you know, on our rehearsals as well as hard workers in the studio. So we worked very, very hard together to make sure that what we did vocally um, was how it was written. So we, was it was it difficult to do? Initially, when we were given the pieces to, to sing, yeah, we had to learn them, but we, we learned them and we and we produ promoted them and produced them on stage. So, you know, and and, and well, one thing that we, that we did uh, was to make sure our stage a version um, was both musical, but something that is important and was important to us uh, was also entertaining. And that's something which is, which is very important for the fans that saw Gentle Giant. They, were, they didn't come away saying, thinking that was, you know, kind of like going to see the uh, New York Philharmonic uh, walking out. And, you know, but, and that was a very, you know, we didn't, want quietness we wanted people to enjoy the experience and have smiles on their faces so that's what we did anyway so as far as the you know promoting and singing knots on stage um ultimately it, it became something natural we, we learned it and and sang it on stage and that was how we did it yeah not to mention the recorders the Record. acoustic guitars have just phenomenal and before we segue into i know Steve wanted to ask you about another Steve. Um, I want to apologize to everyone. I left the intro music on and it was looping and I couldn't even hear it on my end. I just realized that. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, but it, it was quiet. It wasn't like over, like okay. it wasn't clouding anything. So um, 
Yeah, so uh, I had another uh, yes-related question. Uh, but before getting to that, uh, what do you think of the Stephen Wilson remixes of the Gentle Giant material? I think Stephen um, generally uh, does a fantastic job for us. Um, he's uh, he understand, He's a friend. I mean, he's a friend and also a fan, but he's also a really good friend and, and understands the band and understands what it was and what it is we put into the music. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't put his doesn't put the stamp of Steve Wilson produced. He listens to the tracks and and what it, what he does is give them more air and give them more space so you can you can hear um, the instruments much more with much more clarity than than what we had across the board. I think just about every mix he's done, especially um, the missing piece actually, which is um, mm-hmm. coming out in a couple of weeks. Uh, that I think John mentioned it uh, in your last interview. It was very very bass light. Uh, yeah. for a lot of reasons. And, and on this um, new uh, version or new album or the new, new remix, you can actually hear Ray's, you know, Ray's play, playing, which is fantastic as always, yeah. um, you know, on, on, on the, uh, the album. But uh, Stephen um, really has a, a great ear and doesn't change anything. He'll, 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 he'll just adjust uh, things sonically, but, but keeps them the way they wanted, but but gives every instrument and every voice a little more space so you can hear them much clearer. Is there yeah. any discussion, Derek? Or does he just go do his thing? No, he does his thing. And, and generally what he does is send over to myself and Carrie uh, what he's done. And for the most part, we just say, sounds great, go for it. You know, uh, there's I think there was one time when um, there was one, I think Carrie listened to something and it was, some keyboard part which is a little, it wasn't didn't quite work um or sonically it didn't work for him um i think it was a uh, freehand or whatever but mm. it's not a situation where we said stephen no it doesn't work basically what he what he does is is spot on i mean he's got a fantastic ear and he's a friend and was a great fr- and worked um worked with ray on other projects uh before that and you know ray oh. As you you know, passed away at this time last year, which last year, yeah, de- de- devastating to, to all of us, as, and me particularly as a my younger brother and my best friend. But anyway, yeah. um, he worked with him on many other projects, so they knew how to work together. You know, on on whatever projects there were. Awesome, thanks for that. Yeah, and uh, y- you're also um, something that's in the works uh, has to do with playing the full, right? We were talking about it a little bit before going live here. And yeah, dad is... Uh, I have to again. I have to. Yeah. <laughs> so, For those who don't know, this is absolutely one of my favorite live albums. I have a few favorite live albums. Uh, Song Remains the Same, Yes Songs, Keys to Ascension, Queen Live Killers. This is absolutely right there with one of my favorites i just love this album and yeah i know that you saw derek in the interview with john but for those who didn't see it i was introduced to general giant with this album when i was 14 years old which would have been uh, do the math for me steve my math brain is yeah that would have been 77 (laughs) yeah that's funny i think 14 was also when i got into gentle giant back in 2008 2000 Ah, raised the boy right there you go (laughs) (laughs) yeah but let's spill some beans on that what's happening with that and steve wilson well you've got the exclusive on this one because uh, we've just been talking uh just last week with uh steven and um and a guy called dan bornemark who who has been very helpful he lives in sweden um in actually finding the old tracks and helping us get the pack catalog back to our own we own the catalog which is so we've uh, listened and we've decided to um <clears throat> have steven um remix the uh the album but at the same time um go through the all, all the shows as opposed to what is on the album and we've decided to um make it a triple album which uh which Again, you've got an exclusive here because um, uh, we listened to the other tracks and said, why don't we have Stephen remix those? And so it's the whole set as opposed to the the ones we chose for that album. So we're working on that for a sort of late uh, late, uh, summer, 
August, uh, September, October release uh, for a new uh, Stephen Wilson remix of the album. That's awesome. I'm curious, Derek, why was it not a triple album back then? Was it restrictions from the label at the time? Was it just something most bands didn't do? Oh, yeah. of course it wasn't something most bands didn't do. <laughs> I, I, think, I, I don't know, actually. I think it was, uh, I mean, triple albums were, I mean, a double album you know, to, for a, a fan to buy was, a, was, was digging in your pocket. And, and Yeah, that's yeah. true. So I, I think that, um, I don't think there were two, I don't think anyone, well, maybe they did, but. The only I, triples I could think of from back then, Ray, would be 1974, Emerson, Lake, and also the longest title on the planet, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer's Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends, ladies and gentlemen. Blah, 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 blah. But also, yes, songs, and those are the only right. two that come to mind. Right, that's that's true. You're right. I don't know why. I mean, I think we we just listened to the uh, the the, so, the tracks that we I think out of four shows we did in Europe, uh, and we just decided that these are the ones that we're gonna you know put on this double album. But there's a, a, a certainly about um, five or six other tracks that we played on that set. Uh, that were rec recorded just wow. as well. I can't so, wait. Uh, you know, you'll and the intro as well. I mean, the intro is is well, I think it's on there, but uh, it's much longer. So all these other bits and pieces are are on are going to be on this new version of yeah the, the miss the missing pieces you might say. Missing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what formats is it coming out on? All well, there'll be vinyl, CD, Blu-ray, awesome. uh, across the board. You know, flat flat mix, everything else. You oh, know, that's great. All, interesting thanks for sharing that with us that's that's really cool yeah yeah uh so by the late 80s you became ceo of atco records and so you were around when yes uh, following john anderson going to abwh we're considering a new lead vocalist uh, one of them being billy sherwood can you tell us a bit about that period um sure <laughs> uh this is a hmm. So we we jumped from one one thing to okay, sure. Um, I knew Billy Billy very well because Billy I signed uh, when I was at Polygram to uh, he was in um, uh, oh damn I'm blanking on the name um, World Trade right um, and I love I mean I, I really liked them I thought they were really, a really great band I, I signed them actually as I was moving over to Polygram uh, and then. Um, that was, you know, that was something which um, I was happy to do to make sure they got a really good deal. Um, and I got to know Billy very, very well as a friend. Um, and when um, Chris, I think Chris uh, got in touch, and then yeah. I inherited, um, yes, mm -hmm. on, as part of the, uh, 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 as part of my job as being the, the guy that ran ATCO, um, and um, quite truthfully, there was a lot of um, uh, a lot of things that were happening in that camp, as as there always was, always is, as you probably know, yeah. uh, with 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 money, with memberships, and what, and there was there was at least a million and a half dollars spent without having an album. <clears throat> so um, I introduced Chris. And, then, and so John uh, was leaving or had left, and I introduced uh, John uh, to Chris to uh, to uh, um, Billy, and um, and and Trevor Raymond was in that band. Um, but ultimately, and, and I'm going to be truthful here: those costs of this album went were flying so out of control. It was there was millions of dollars spent without having a note played, and they were continually asking for more money. And they were going pretty much to other things other than recording. Let me just put it that way. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, so, and this is a bizarre thing. I had to say, look, I don't think I can do with it. I don't think we can do this anymore. And they and the band that was Yes went over to Arista. So it's a sort of strange kind of bizarre twist that I was, you know, like 10 or 15 years earlier, was on the road, um, you know, uh, working – as a the, as the opening back for yes, and here I was saying, "Sorry, guys, we don't want you." Yeah, weird, <laughs> weird how it works, huh? But, but you know, I, I'm still very great friends with them even today. I'm I'm, I'm in touch with them many all the time. You know, so oh, that's uh, great. 
Yeah, I think you've done other work with Billy since, yeah. right? Billy and, and Chris, Steve and everyone. Yeah, and I'm, yeah, you know, yeah, I absolutely have. Uh, been in That's touch great. With Good friends. John mentioned in the interview with me last week that part of the disbandment of General Giant was sort of somewhat unspoken on that last tour. And he felt that much to do with that had to do with the lack of label support at the time. My question in that area, Derek, is when you did become in a, the power and the glory as a record executive, was there not an opportunity to kind of re-sign your own band to one of those labels where where they'd be able to still perpetuate the career? Or was it that Prague just wasn't as in vogue anymore? I know in the US it wasn't. I was like an idiot. I was in a prog band in the early 80s. And by then it was all skinny tie, new wave, or it was spandex and hairspray. But in the Netherlands and parts of Europe, Prague was still very much alive and we just couldn't get a deal because of that. So did that have anything to do with why you didn't bring Gentle Giant into one of the labels that you worked with? No, not at all. Um, okay. No, I mean, really, when John, you know, John um, said, had mentioned that it was kind of an organic thing. That, you know, the truth was uh, when we, when we all got together, and it was in New York, and we were still, you know, um, in in England, uh, and we we came over. Well, I, I was I was over here, um, but um, I think I think that um, both Carrie and myself were married. We had kids, um, and it's it just felt like had we continued to carry on, the you know the musical horizons had changed, as as you probably know. But apart from that, um, I think for all of us, uh, it kind of felt like okay, this pattern of touring, rehearsing, writing, touring, rehearsing, writing became something. I hate to say it, like like a job. And when something becomes a job in the arts, in music, then it becomes something less creative and something which is. You know, like clocking in a, a, your, your time clock, and it was yeah. that kind of felt like that was what we were doing. It didn't affect our, you know, our, our stage performance at all. But we loved that. I mean, right. that was, you know, that was the the, the the hour and a half, two hours where we we lived our lives, if you like. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, um, but <clears throat> um, it just felt like it was a time at the time. So at the beginning of the tour, um, we actually said, look. Uh, this is Carrie and myself said, I don't think we really want to do this much longer. And, you know, there was a bit of an element of surprise to Gary and John. Ray was kind of in the, on the fence about it. But we just said, OK, well, well, let's see how we how we do. We did very well on that tour. Mm -hmm. But it was really we all knew it was at the, you know, at the last game. We we're going to say, OK, we had our run. We are on to new things. So really, when you ask me about um, re reviving, uh, sure, I could have done it, but that, that was a different chapter, a different yeah, life. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, and, and the chapter for all of us moved. Uh, Ray became uh, a producer, um, yeah. you know, and signed some fantastic bands. Um, Kerry, you know, <clears throat> went, went to things that he wanted to do, as did the other guys. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and and, looking oh, at ahead. the... Yeah, looking in the comments, uh, I see we have uh, something that's sort of related uh, to that. So it's kind of putting one hat that you got later and uh, imagining if you had that on a different time. Uh, Elizabeth Reese asks, how would you have promoted Gentle Giants music differently if you had been a record label promoter at the time instead of in the band? Um, well... Uh, one, the one thing I did learn uh, immediately, because I, you know, I jumped from being a musician to being in the music business, which is almost like you know, becoming Darth Vader. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I kind of felt like that, but you know what? It was something that I was offered, and I thought, well, is it something I wanted to? Let me explore it. And I just remember the first day I, I worked at Polygram, and it was a. Um, the, and at the end of the first day, my my heart sung all the way to my feet 
because I realized that the the music business, how can I put this, was not the business I thought it was. It was about every mm. artist having their priorities and it was about um, politics, it was about money, it was about uh, perks. And yeah, there was music involved, but that wasn't the, the prime motivation. Had I known that prior to that, I, I probably, you know, having, you know, been the, overseeing the, the group with, you know, with, with Ray, uh, thought about, okay, so let me get, you know, Columbia or Capital on my side by, you know, schmoozing or woozing or whatever it is. But um, you learn by, you learn by, by doing it and experiencing it. So, um, no, you know, it's, it's, it, it was basically, you, you, you need a champion who could make a difference in a record company. And I became that for many other bands, ultimately. But in the days when we were on tour, we had champions that didn't, but couldn't pull the, I guess, couldn't pull, ring the green bell that, that said, okay, let's go for it, which is, which is sad. But nevertheless, you know, that being said, I, in some ways, I'm glad we didn't because we, I, I, I hate to use the word because it sounds contrite and so it sounds, uh, bloated if you like but we left the legacy which is unt untouched by yeah and that's fair absolutely you can use that and in in being instrumental and in sung all those bands after and i gotta move my camp she'll eat my plant <laughs> <Get out of here. laughs> sorry sorry baby um, <clears throat> that makes me feel that perhaps when you saw what the music business really is at that time how edgy was it for you to make the decision to sign the bands that you signed? Because obviously you had a criteria, you had things you looked for, listened for, but each one of those was a risk. And, and thankfully, so many have gone on to have decades long careers. Were there some that felt either more risky to you than others, or were there somewhere no one, somewhere no one else was supporting you, but you took a chance anyways, and they had a great career. Are there any stories like that in there, Derek? Um, yeah, there are actually. There, there's uh, quite a few, in fact. Um, the one, I mean, this is the business side here, as opposed to General Giant. But you know yeah. what? Hey, um, the ones that um, went on to have a, have lasting impact, if you like. Um, I'll bring up the first signing I ever I ever had. In fact, was it? Polygram when I first started was Bon Jovi. Now, uh, you know, a lot of fans here will say, boo, hiss, boo. No. <laughs> but no, they're a great band. <clears throat> the one thing that John Bon Jovi had when he sat in front of me as a 18 year old kid, he told me, he literally looked me in the eye and said, I want to be bigger than Elvis. And I thought he was joking. I, I, I thought, okay, this is, this is, uh, you know, this is some blowhard kid who's a second cousin owns a power station but the intensity and his drive and his ambition was something you 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 had you couldn't capture and that's something which um i i just learned from him uh knowing that how much he would i mean they were so that that's just a, that's a quick you know two minute uh um uh way of knowing that something is going to happen. He knew he would wanted that to be that, and he'd do everything in his, in his uh, world and whatever he did to make that happen. Uh, and, it, and it was something that you, could, you couldn't capture. We wanted to be music, musicians. Um, uh, I, we, I don't think the band Gentle Giant ever thought about being as big as possible. We just wanted to be great out there and, 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 and entertain and make good music. John wanted to be a megastar, 100%. And you can't capture that. The other band that I, I bring up, if you like, is Pantera. Oh. Um, which, you know, I, is, is some, you know, I was running at Cohen and, and um, I, I had, I saw a, a tape of theirs when I was at Polygram, but I went down to see them, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, as running the company, you know, uh, and I went down, you know, and you you said, okay, well, you know, show show me what you got. Yeah. And it was a little club in Arlington. And 
they played to this you know, 40, 50 kids in this club, and they were just mind-blowingly good. It just wow. it was insanity. Phil Anselmo and, and Dimebag and, and Vidi and, and Rex, I, became, I didn't just look and say, hmm, I could, I, could, I could work with them. I became an, a fan in the third song. I wow. Said, and, and they had just had everything. Um, they were that good and that, that powerful. And I knew that they would not get on MTV. They would not get on, which was a big marketing thing in that, those days. They would not get on a radio. But if I was blown away being this, you know, hard show running in the record company, then the kids who were there, who were like, a, the mosh pit was small because there was only a, few, a little hub. But if I took them out and, and put them out there in front of the world, they would think the same thing, and that's what I did. I, I put some money behind them as tour as a touring their situation, and sure enough, within a year or two, I mean, they became massive. Yeah, I saw them open for. It was for Deep Purple when Ian Gillen was on vocals and Bev Bevan was the touring drummer. They were the second loudest band I've ever heard. I won't count who the very first band was I saw in a real venue was Led Zeppelin. I won't count that because I'd never seen a concert of that magnitude. So I don't count them. But the first loudest band was King Crimson on the, I think, Thrak tour. I've never done this in my life, Derek. I left after the third song. I was in the eighth row. John Paul Jones opened for them, thankfully. So I got to see that on his second tour. They were so loud. I, I was getting nauseous and Meniere's kicking in and it was just unbelievable. But Pantera crushed it on stage they were so good live what what year was that just as a reference. um so born again with ian gill and i want to say 80 nine eighty maybe nine. earlier mid 80s because they did the thing when richie blackmore came back in 84 i think so it might have been 86 after that something like that mid 80s ish i think okay. no because uh when, I, when they were signed, as 89, uh, when I signed them. Um, so then it must have been after that. Maybe Steve's looking it up. I might have the, the year wrong. I might even have the opening band. I mean, the the band they played with, but I thought it was, but they were great. They were really yeah. loud, but they were great. So, you know, just, you know, and the, the one, the other thing you asked me about um, is that um, I don't think I signed a band that the other record companies would be chasing, chasing uh for um for uh you know to, because they were the, the new thing um right. but how about your colleagues did you ever have colleagues saying derek don't do it it's I, i'm not with you on this one but you did it okay. anyways and it, what are a couple of those bands that that you knew would just be it was worth the risk that other people weren't behind in some respect bon jovi because uh you know he had one track and he didn't have a band um and uh, he had a job at, with, at the power station. And a couple of guys in the department said, yeah, he looks cute, but I mean, that, he's got one song. I mean, but I, but I met with him and I met with his, his mom and dad, actually. Oh, uh, wow. Um, and um, I just knew. And, you know, a couple of guys, yeah, you know, is, is, he, is he a pop? Is it Rex Smith? Is it, is it Eddie Van? H I, I, we don't know what it is. And I, kind of, I knew what he wanted to be. And I said, what? I said to him, what do you want to be? He said, I want to be a rock star. You know, so other people were not sure about it, but I, I was sure about it with him. And I helped him, in some respects, see his, you know, uh, see his vision. Um, awesome. You know, there are other other things. Um, for instance, Dream Theater, you mentioned Dream Theater. Um, yeah. That was signed, believe it or not, um, on, um, well, they had an album, I think, on uh, another, another label, um, and it didn't do anything. Hmm. Uh, they were dropped, uh, and um, Mike Portnoy uh, came with with a four track um, instrumental, no vocals, but they were they were superb. And, and a guy called Derek Oliver, who worked with me, said, "You know what? We should we should look at this." And a couple of the other guys in the company, even though I was running it, said, "There's no vocal. We don't know what's going to be." But I sat down with Mike in the back, you know, and and uh, and said, "So." Where do you want to go with this? They, and they, and they, they said, we're going to get a great singer. And they presented the album with, with I think, who's the singer? Um, Mike Produce. Yeah. Yeah. And um, 
Yeah. So, I mean, there, there's always questions, but if you have a champion and, and a champion that will stick their neck out for you and be able to hit the green light, if you like, then you've got a chance. That was back in the day. Today is a whole different animal. You know, it's, it's just completely right. Interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I want to switch gears and go back to Gentle Giant Good. in a very specific area. And if I can manage to press the right buttons, the area I want to show everybody and have you chime in on is uh, fashion. So if I'm doing the math right, Derek, from 1972 to 1974 isn't really that much time, right? Yet, when I think of my two favorite Gentle Giant concerts um, that I've seen, and I look at how you guys were dressed back in like 72, almost kind of like more hippie-ish, renaissance-y. Yeah, I think that might be 74, and the yeah. other picks we have are from 78. Oh, yeah. Okay. Ah, sorry, I got the years wrong. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, now you know why I need a babysitter, Derek, uh, even though it's my baby. <laughs> I'm wearing my dress here. Yeah. And then and then fast forward slightly um, a bit more of a pedestrian look, you know, John with his Oakland A's uniform. Uh, you know, we've we've got you in the jumpsuit, Ray in the vest and, and so on. Was that a conscious thing or did you see a shift in music and fashion coming as time moved closer towards the 80s? That's a good point. Um please excuse uh, uh, the drum suit uh, jumps with everyone because it looks on retrospect it looks so stupid <laughs> i love it you jumping around in a jumpsuit that's what it's for <laughs> yeah, yeah okay but you know I, again please forgive me <laughs> uh, you know it looks like freddie mercury on on steroids or something but uh um they, uh, you can make, make a good point because it's um i guess uh we were changing a little musically and so i you know i we again putting the uh the the, the fashion and the music together we were we were honing it down to a degree from the earliest days and i think that our music uh reflected more of a rock element as well as you know what what we could do musically um so i guess our our fashion was was more in line with um being able to jump around a little more as opposed to being, you know, me wearing a dress and and and, and, and Gary wearing a Robin Hood suit, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, 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 yeah, a good point, and and I, I guess it was subliminal. I, you know, that's all I can say. There was yeah. something that in the music that made us change our uniforms, as we call, you know, yeah. and um, and our stage suits, uh, the stage gear. So, uh, you know, and John wearing his Oakland A's uniform, you know, and to tell you the truth, uh, if you saw us at the beginning of the tour and saw us at the end of the tour, you wouldn't want to get any close to us because the, the clothes literally stood up on their own. <laughs> 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 As you know, it was very difficult, difficult to get washing done in after you, you know, when you do days after days on the road. Yeah. And not having four sets of everything. Exactly that. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, a couple other comments. Uh, Chuck says, Chuck Michelson says, love to hear a Steve Wilson remix of In a Glass House. We would too. Um, in fact, <laughs> Stephen, in fact, that was the very first uh, um, request he made um, back in the day. He said, I, I'd love to remix In a Glass House. And we searched and searched and searched and no one could find the Maltese Oh, oh wow! So that's that's one where I think uh, Stephen's touch would be absolutely magnificent because that's wow. that initially for me anyway, and for the band that was a very difficult record to make, and 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 it was very hard for us because that was what the the album after my brother Phil left. Yeah, and and um, and I didn't. I mean, it was very tough for both myself and Ray, but and it was, but it when I hear it now. Um, I love it. I mean, I think it's really a really great album. Crazy, but great. Yeah, um, and the live piece has come off really well. well. Yeah. So it's interesting that the multis are nowhere to be found. Maybe they were launched into space in a time capsule with some other stuff or something. Well, I, mean, I, hope it, I hope it comes back and crashes into Manhattan. And I, and I pick it up and 
and then we'll, go, we'll give it to Steve. But but because it, it's it's very dry, it's very it was I mean literally it was written, um, and produced and released in a period of six weeks. It was it was it was so quickly done. Uh, we we were, we always wrote very quickly and, and and produced things. You know we didn't ponder our our work. We we uh, you know we we worked. We're hard workers. We really were. Um, That's great. But this this is the one which I I feel the same way that it would be great if Stephen was able to do this, but we can't find the multis. Oh wow! Maybe they'll show up sometime, and I might have to you know get up and kick my cat out. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. So uh, while we're talking about those albums, do you have like any interesting nuggets to share about the interview album? Since we're in an interview, so we might as well talk about that. Um. Well, interview was the album after uh, the live album. Um, it, it was it was a good album, but the the, the premise, um, you know, we before we, we spoke, I, we were we were chatting about the ways people used to, you know, especially in North America, um, we were taking around. You know, we we we'd say we'd come to a city, and. Um, we'd uh, have the promotion guy saying, okay, this radio wants to speak to you. This radio person wants to speak to you. And they really didn't do the homework. I mean, they didn't know who the hell we were. You know? oh, wow. So even even though we toured or, or didn't, or maybe they didn't want to do their work, and this is a gig they had to do, so they got this band who were playing in town to come over and and and, and, and ask us questions, which were basically, um, you know, what's your, you know, how did you, you? It's just the same old, same old. Yeah. And it didn't, they didn't delve into you know, jumping into things that you delve into, or other people who are who know the band delve into. They didn't know anything about the past or the history or anything else. But the standard interview, how many in the band? What's what's your latest album? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And it became, um, I guess, in some ways, uh, um, uh, I can't think of the word, but anyway, it, it was a little um, kind of monotonous, repetitive, yeah, a little frustrating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vanilla. Um, there's a great question in the comments. I'm going to show on screen from uh, Zachary because this ties into something I wanted to ask. He says, "This year marks the 50th anniversary of the Power and the Glory. How do you feel about looking back on that album today? And with that, how does it feel to be in your 70s?" And have your music from so long ago still be so relevant to so many people? Well, uh, first of all, to answer the question about uh, looking back on the power and the glory, I think I think it's probably one of our best albums, uh, um, both recording wise and lyrically, lyrically, what lyrical wise. Um, and I think the fact that the subject matter and the music as well, of course. Um, still holds holds up if you like today um and thinking back i mean i, I think you know when i saw you with john I, you know, I look back and think wow did i do that i mean or did i play did i write that or did we did we play that um and the fact that um it's still relevant and and, and today in, in today's atmosphere especially in in the uh the atmosphere of this this uh, um, polarizing, uh, right, yeah. awful situation. This the the lyrics and, and and the music and everything else is is still very relevant. And it's fifty years since we we did it, and and, and the fact that we we it's still um, as relevant as it was back in the day. I think. Yeah, absolutely. One of, my, one of my favorite albums. It was one of the easiest albums we made. Oh wow. We, the we tour were, was great too. Yeah, it, we 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 were very mature as a band, and we were riding quite a wave. I mean, we we were we were headlining some pretty big gigs in in um, Europe, especially and North America, and we were we were on a roll. So we were, you know, we were we were on our game. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That's awesome. Um, there's a couple different 
questions that are this or rather the same question from different people on different channels watching asking what it was like working with Stephen Wilson and folks you might have missed it but Derek said extremely frustrating they're never doing it again <laughs> next question no I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Derek Menchie has been a friend, great to work with. Um, but this is an interesting question from uh, Chuck Michelson also asked, will progressive rock ever become retro cool or is it too inaccessible? Um, and I'm not sure how you mean, Chuck, but how do you interpret that, Derek? Well, I t I'll tell you what's, what's interesting to me. Um, in 2020, 2021, my son Noah, who's... who's um, who has, has worked at, at Sony Legacy actually, um, but he, he's he's left that now. Put together a video of um, of proclamation out of the power and the glory, and from fans who went online and played the music of General Giant. I saw that. It's awesome. Okay, so you see who the fans are, and they're not fans of old farts like me. <laughs> they're fans who are. In their twenties and third, and, and and even teens, the twenties and thirties, who love the music, yeah, and are, are and they're, they're really good. I mean, so the fact that they're playing along and, and playing their parts tells me that you know, cool or not, there are musicians and people who love real music. I'm not saying the Jungle Giant is the epitome of it, but will will um, will always be. Um, you know, whether it's progressive or, or symphonic or, or even pop, we'll always love real music as opposed to something which is composed on a Pro Tools or 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 or, a, or to or dance to. Not that your music isn't all danceable, but no, exactly. <laughs> you might throw a hip out on a couple of songs I could think of. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, is it, that's that's um, something which is uh, um, I, I, you know that is fascinating, and and it was great to see these young guys playing our music and loving it and enjoying it. So talk about cool. I, I, the other side of the coin, if you don't mind me bringing this up, is yeah, please. this world of hip hop. Yeah. Which is, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you aware, are aware that the people, they, they're some of the uh, big tastemakers in hip hop and the biggest artists um, are enamored by our band. Um, yeah. Oh, we've, wow. We've been at the top of the charts at the beginning of the year with Travis Scott, who opens his album with um, Proclamation. Wow, that I didn't know. So that's if you, interesting. If you look at Travis Scott and he opens his show with Proclamation, uh, there's a band called Run the Jewels, which has sampled Knots. And oh, wow. Cool. And so we've become a, a, the darlings of the hip hop world. That's neat. And I, I think that. that in some ways, some of the int more interesting progressive bands, and this is going to sound bizarre to a lot of people out there, are in the hip hop world. They turn things and move things around that I think we did before. And so did Yes, and so did other bands of our ilk. That's so interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, I have one more comment to share. Um, Robin Pearson says, I saw you, I think it might take up too much of the screen. Let's try it. Oh, there we go. I saw you in the 70s at Portsmouth. Good all. General Giants music has held a special place in my part in my heart since those days. I think the complex structure of your music is one of the reasons that it has been so sustaining and enduring for me and other fans. Would you agree, Derek? Yes. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I find it interesting because the things he points out as being endearing is what has turned off a lot of people who for lack of better words, maybe aren't musos. So they're into something that's just four on the floor, something they can dance to, something they don't need to think about. But there's always an audience for everything. I mean, that's why there's so many genres of music. Right? Yeah, yeah. I think that um, sometimes people underestimate younger audiences. Like I feel like as soon as people, you know, be when they're teens or when they get into college and they're like discovering like what they're into and they'll get into music and some of them and I've seen this firsthand with friends of mine they'll like really dig deep into like music that's very different from just what's on the radio or whatever and they'll like champion it like so they'll go back and discover some prog rock and be like oh what can I listen to that's more like this type of thing, you know? 
Well, you know, again, I, I just will say that in some ways, um, you ask you asked earlier about um, would I, you know, resign? No, I think the fact that we um, we did what we did, and we did it for honestly, we did it because we love music. We love pushing ourselves musically. Right. Internally, we were we were we were driven internally, and we we tried to be better for each other, and then taking it on stage and entertaining the audience and and playing with with um you know with with uh some kind of smile on our faces being able to do what we did i guess um and having an audience ha walk out with a smile on their faces because they were entertained as well as hopefully musically um uh musically entertained also um but the the fact that we didn't continue, um, I think, is good because sometimes when you do that, you try to re relive something you did 10, 12 years ago and or you, you become some, some kind of parody of what you were. And that's one thing that the band, I know each person, we're still in touch, and we're still great friends. We never want to be a parody of ourselves. That's so, awesome that you guys did, you know, stay in touch. We don't see that with a lot of bands which is really cool and it speaks to i think the time you spent together creating and touring and and doing what you did um oh i had a question it just flew out of my brain oh it, this may sound like a dumb question but is there such thing as getting signed anymore or is it more you have to come out as your own publisher or you got to prove yourself as an independent artist first before a quote label takes a chance on you. What does that business side of the scape of the music industry look like compared to, say, the seventies, Derek? The, the whole world has changed. I mean, um, since the, the advent of the internet, of course, uh, and and the, the the advent of you know having music um, be streamed and or being able to make you know music on the computer when you're not a musician, um, right? And that, that's something that I feel very sad about, actually, because when we started and when I started my, with my brothers, you know, I was in school and, and we, 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 we toured our asses off uh, in my first group before General Giant. I mean, everywhere and, and every night and we got no sleep. Well, we, we became good. We get, became good at what we did, you know, musically. Right, and doing we, it a lot, too. Yeah. And, and, and there were places to do that. And, and we wanted that to, to be. But uh, Today, everyone wants to be famous without putting the work in, um, and that's 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 uh, that's unfortunate to me. I, you know, it doesn't say, you know, it doesn't bode well for someone who wants to be a great musician because you have to put a huge amount of work in to get there. And and today, um, it's much more difficult to get uh, signed, honestly, to a label because labels, quite honestly. Uh, rely on their catalogs. Yeah, new band, except for you know uh, 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 Taylor Swift or, or or Beyonce or whatever. You know th those th those things uh, they are long in in in, uh, in in developing. But quite honestly, musical you have to go out there and do what we did back in the day: is go out there and build your audience, one fan by one fan, and become really really good. And also the other thing is just be unique. Don't care about what other people are doing. Do mm. something which is yours. Yeah, that's great advice. And the economics are completely different in the industry. Even if you look at the standpoint of putting on a live production, what it costs now for trucks and lodging and the stage show and the rigging and all of that, you know, and then studios now. And just, it's a whole different world. Like you said, it really is in every way, every direction. It is, but you know what? It's still you still can do it. I mean, if you really want to do it, you can still. You don't have to have the production. If if you're good enough, and unique enough, then then go out there and do it, and don't worry about what anyone else says. Just build your audience and be really great. Be unique. Be great. And it doesn't matter if a label will sign you or not. You you will get there. But you know, the, anyone, a lot of people who who are who want you know who. Um, don't want to put the time in won't put the time in and that right. it takes time and, and it takes a lot of effort but you have to have you know blinkers on and say i don't care what this says i'm going to live on bread and water or, or live with my mom until i'm 50 whatever it takes yeah. 
Sometimes I feel like I live with my mom. That's another story. Well, my wife's <laughs> my mom, so it's nice. Um, and and referencing um, what Steve mentioned earlier about you know a, a younger generation. Steve actually lived that. He's he's twenty nine, and he I think what most of what you listen to is prog, right, Steve? I mean, almost all of it. Yeah, most of it. But I do dabble in a few different genres here and there. It's funny. I was actually listening to an old podcast recently where someone was like, yeah, what most people, when they say they listen to everything, they don't really, but they, I literally they don't even know what everything is. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I wouldn't say I listen to everything, but definitely like several different genres. I like yeah. I think people say that who don't know what they are actually listening to, right. you know, I, I've never heard a real music fan say that. Hmm. Well, the, the interesting thing about the genres, if you like today, and, when we were start when we started out i mean in in england uh in a different band in simon dupree um and gentle giant as well was there wasn't quite as much um segregation delegation of, of, of exactly. types of music i mean we played with different kinds of bands you know we, we i think john mentioned playing with the eagles on a, on a bill we yeah. played shanana you know yeah. <laughs> we played with uh J, you know jay giles um <laughs> It wasn't, you know, and, and you know, they but we both went up. It wasn't uh, a time when, um, if you like this band, then you should like the other band, you know. Right. And the radio wasn't like that. I, mm -hmm. I love telling the story that growing up in Los Angeles, starting to play the drums shortly before I turned seven, so like late 69, and then into 70, 71, 72, those years, I would just put on headphones turn on the 93 KHJ was the station. And I'd hear Neil Diamond, then the Rolling Stones, then Led Zeppelin, uh, then uh, uh, you know, Barbus Streisand, for goodness sakes. You know, it was just a mix. There was no, almost no, there was that. Then there was maybe country, which at the time was Gene Autry and uh, Johnny Cash. And then there was the classical stuff. And that, that was about it, other than talk radio back then. That's correct. And then then it became corporatized in the, in the mid to late 70s. And then that's when the hit song from the album uh, became a very important factor. And that's the kind of the, if you like, in certain respects for some bands like uh, Genesis, who had a, a hit song, which you know, crossed over to pop. Yeah. Um, we're able to survive. And we were we were hopeless of writing hit songs. You know, we we you don't think Knox is a single? <laughs> You don't think Knots is a single? Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe today it would be. Maybe, in fact, it was a hit single for uh, uh, Run the Jewels. Ah, nice. It was, right. it was a new track on um, Black Panther. Ah, wow. So I just, <laughs> but you no. never know. But um, the um, no, so it was so it was there was a change in radio, which is the main form of marketing, if you like, in the late seventies, and I think that's together with punk. You know, coming in and being, you know, what what it what it scared people in the music business or or innovators or energized it was uh, something of a um, a shake up hmm. for everyone, including yeah you know, the band and and bands of our ilk, if you like, as well. Yeah, interesting. I'd like to share one last question from the audience before we go. And when we do go, Derek, please stay on the line with Steve and I just for a couple minutes, okay? Uh, this is from Ives Boulay. I e hope I'm pronouncing it. Yves Boulay, I think okay. it's pronounced. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, where did it go? There it is. He yeah, said, the question for you was freehand one of Gentle Giant's most powerful harmonies. I didn't hear it, sorry. Was freehand one of Gentle Giant's most powerful harmonies? Um, well, I mean, yeah, I think freehand um, as an album uh, was was a was a really powerful album I, I, and, and harmonically you know it was as far as singing is concerned um i think it was it was quite well done uh, i think the, the whole playing was was well done and it was a great album to uh it was a what is one of my favorites too uh you know i have two or three favorites one or two uh, not some of the fans favorites but I, I i think it's um uh yeah it was it was well written well well played and and we were able to take it on the road and um, 
and play it fairly well. So uh, with with vocal harmonies as well. You know, I can't I can't see two voices. So either you know, Carrie or Ray or Gary or, or John would harmonize with me. Uh, and we could all sing, which is which is good. And we could all play guitar. The one that you mentioned uh, in another interview about what we were able to do, and we could all trade instruments and play each other's instruments. So that was a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to do. Yeah, that's neat. Thanks. Tell everybody what you're up to now. Um, what I'm up to is, is um, I'm actually involved in um, two or three music documentaries, uh, you know, musical documentaries, which oh, nice a story about some of the things either I've been involved in and and, and or other things uh, uh, that I've done. But they're you know they're kind of interesting. Um, one is about the in 1991. Um, when I was writing Atco, uh, we put on the biggest ever um, outdoor show in the world ever in Moscow. Oh, wow. Monsters of uh, Rock. Uh, and we took over ACDC, Metallica, Pantera, um, Black Crows, and a Russian band. And 1.7 million people attended it. Wow. With a story behind it. Um, Wait, were there bathrooms? <laughs> are, you, are you kidding? There, it's, that, that we're talking about Moscow in 1991. Oh. It, it was just after the war came down. Yeltsin, it was the Paris Troika time. Uh, anyway, the story behind it is, apart from the concert, which was the most incredible concert you'd ever see, um, it was just mind-blowing. But the story of corruption and bringing over bags of a million dollars worth of $100 bills to pay off Boris Yeltsin and the army, and, and wow. flying back on the Concorde to get more money to, let, to allow the concert to continue. Wow. So that's one of the documentaries. So, and the other ones, in fact, my son Noah is working on a, bad, uh, on a documentary with um, a very well-known um, hip hop uh, slash uh, music presenter. I won't say his name. Okay. Um, he's on the Tonight Show. Um, uh, about the influence of Gentle Giant um, both in the music world, which we had no idea about, but also in the hip hop world. Interesting. Yeah, you talked about some of that, and that's that's really interesting. So it's it, and there's a, a couple more. But anyway, I'm, I'm involved in those, and I'm overseeing a couple of friends, and, and, and but I'm you know I'm not in the trenches. I'm I'm too old for that stuff. I'm you know I'm decrepit, and you know. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> Well, do you still have the jumpsuit? <laughs> but, boy, boy, I couldn't get when I saw myself, you know, when I look back and think, what the hell was I thinking? <laughs> well, thank I, you I think so we've much. all been through that. Yeah, I was thinking that. You're right. Um, <laughs> I was thinking about that, something I did yesterday. Thanks so much, Derek, for taking time with us. Please hang on the line uh, after we say goodbye to the audience. And audience, thank you so much for following what we do here on Yes Shift and simulcasting on Drum Talk TV. You can find Yes Shift audio only at anchor.fm slash Yes Shift and on YouTube at www.youtube.com slash at Yes Shift and facebook.com slash Yes Shift. And the Drum Talk TV channels on pretty much everything is at Drum Talk TV. Thanks, everybody. Uh, more to come soon. We're, we've got just tons of new stuff. We're front loading the, the year. I can't believe it's almost the end of the first quarter. But Steve and I will see you soon. And I'll see you soon on Drum Talk TV as well. Thanks, everyone. See you, everyone.